Welcome to the Survivalist Podcast with Mark Buhali, Doc Montana, and Matt Gould. In each episode of the Survivalist Podcast, we look at different events and catastrophes that can happen to you. Then we give you the knowledge, resources, and recommendations you need to survive. The Survivalist Podcast is brought to you by Forge Survival Supply. In an era of uncertainty, Forge Survival Supply provides more than emergency supplies. We bring you and your family peace of mind. Use the promo code SURVIVAL at checkout at ForgeSurvivalSupply.com for 10% off your order. This podcast is sponsored by Epic Water Bottles and Pitchers. Every year, millions of Americans get sick from drinking contaminated water. Epic water filters remove chlorine, heavy metals, chemicals, industrial pollutants, pesticides and herbicides, iodine, and microbiologicals from your water. All of this is done with BPA-free, recyclable bottles and pitchers that are made in the USA. So keep your family safe and healthy with Epic Water. You can use the promo code WATER at EpicWaterFilters.com for 10% off your order there. Welcome to the Survivalist Podcast. This is episode 16. And I'm here with Mark Buhali and Doc Montana as usual. How are you guys doing? Great. Very good. Very good. And we have a special guest today, Monty Miles, who is a lifelong survivalist. And today we're going to be talking about bargain prepping or bargain bug out bag. Thrift stop prepping, ways that you can be prepared for a small amount of money, which I know is always a hot topic. We did a couple episodes about winter survival a while ago, and we've done episodes about bug out bags. I just checked on Amazon. I saw the ultimate bug out bag that you could buy for about $189. And let's say that uh, you don't want to do that. What is the best place to start, Monty? Uh, well, first I'd have to say if you were spending online 190 bucks for the best bug out bag, it's probably full of a bunch of junk. You know, I'd have to see it first and how much is in there, but it's been my experience that a lot of that stuff in that price range just really is not that good a deal, um, if, if it's comprehensive. But anyway, um, you know, I discovered thrift stores in earnest about a decade ago. Um, I've been hitting yard sales forever and always looking for gear, 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 gear. Um, and I decided, well, God, I'm going to go into this Goodwill. Haven't been in one in forever, and uh, I happen to live in an area where there are some really good thrift stores. I've been around the country to other thrift stores that I thought were pretty weak. So in that respect, I'm lucky. I'm always looking for deals. I don't go through going. I got to pick up a pair of pants today. I have to pick up this today. I just go through, and whatever's there and is a good deal and it's quality stuff, I grab it. So. Yeah, it's pre- gotten pretty much out of control after a decade, let me tell you. <laughs> if you could see my Fortress of Solitude right here in the gear collection I have, you'd be uh, wondering about my sanity probably at this point. <laughs> so, Monty, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you. When you say you, can, you pick up a bargain, bargain, are you looking for a pack? Are you looking for your basic like EDC, your everyday carry supplies? Are you looking for your ultimate bug out gear? Are you looking, like you mentioned, some clothing, a jacket, cold weather, um, a tarp, a parka? What specific gear are you are you looking for? Are you kind of just, or are you, for lack of better terminology, are you hoarding shit that you could potentially need in the future? And anything, even if you have ten of them, man, I found a great pair of freaking wool trowel for the winter, and they're five bucks, and I'm gonna pick those up too, and I'm gonna throw them in my kit. I mean, what specific items? Let's talk about like the person getting started. What what should they look at and what should they look for? The first thing they they got to have the proper mindset if they're going to start looking for bargains. Uh, bottom line is if you need something right now, be prepared to pay full price. So when you go into a store and let's just let's just talk about the one person. I'm just getting something for me. Um, you go through and you've got to pretty much be a regular in those stores. Because you get a, also a vibe as to when they put the new stuff out, um, when stuff comes in, you know, and you get a flow for it. If you're just hitting the store once every couple months, you know, it's going to be a long-term thing getting prepared. So your mindset has mm-hmm. got to be, hey, if I'm going into town, and me, I'm about 35 minutes outside of town. I live up in the mountains, and I go down about once a week. I used to go down more often, but life has changed. So, uh, but I go down and I have a route. There's about five thrift stores down there, 
And, uh, you know, I just, I go through them and I circle through. So what I would tell people would be go in with an open mind. Okay, today, maybe I find a great pair of cargo pants. Maybe I find a jacket. Wow, there's a backpack over there. Um, Sometimes you walk out of the store with nothing. You know, Mm -hmm. don't buy something just because you feel you have to buy something. Um, Maybe it's a wool blanket. You know, I have found water filters that look brand new ceramic water filters. And uh, I pick them up for, you know, a few bucks. You just never so with go- that, with your, with your store routes, are you going to a Dollar General, a thrift shop, a military surplus store, a Goodwill, a, uh, a Walmart, or a Kmart? I don't know if you have like Kmart's or like a discount store where you live. Like what's your, what's your criteria for a good store? Okay. Um, I'll tell you all the places I frequent far as thrift stores go. Um, and once again, the thrift stores we have in this area are bad. Um, so there's a Goodwill, there is a um, Salvation Army, there's a Humane Society thrift store, which I do volunteer work at once a week. And I, you, get to get I, the, you get the good shit before it gets, goes on the shelves anyway, so that's a yeah, good well, thing, right? Yeah, well, I didn't say that, but uh, right. yeah, of course I, I work the donation, so I'm sorting stuff, and I'm, I'm an organizational freak, so I can sit mm-hmm. there and I can rip through stuff quickly and separate stuff out. Um, but anyway, and then there's another, there's the hospice thrift store. Um, wow. And there's another one that it's, it's its own name, and basically they, uh, their mission is to help out homeless people. So that is mm-hmm. the five. There used to be um, another one that closed down called, uh, what was it, Savers? Yeah, and it closed mm-hmm. down. So there was a sixth one. But those would be the five core ones that I hit. As far as department stores go, you know, I, there's a Target down there. There's no Walmarts, no Kmarts around. But I'll hit Target, and that's where I'll buy my, my brand-new socks and underwear. And that's about it. That's mm-hmm. about all I'm going to buy in department stores anymore because I find everything I need in these thrift stores and yard sales um yep and you're doing it on the cheap i mean literally not 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 quality but you're getting stuff i mean it's bargain you're the ultimate bargain shopper no, for survival. Dude, it is all quality stuff i don't buy any junk i mean okay i'm just going to give you an example right now i'm looking at the walls of my office i've got rei backpacks i got Heinz Snowbridge, quality old american-made gear ospreys military gear i got world war ii stuff Jan Sport, um, Wow, Tough Traveler, From- Kelty, Lowell <laughs> Alpine, all quality stuff that I, I mean, without going into it, I could point to a certain backpack and tell you, yeah, I've got that thing for five bucks. I got that for 10 bucks. Um, Damn, that's awesome. And I know, I know those brands. I'm sure Doc does too. Matt, I don't know if you're familiar with those, but those are all, those are, I mean, those are the top, some of the top brands, if not the top brands that, uh, that I would look at from, in any in any outdoor store, anyone. Yeah, and trying to get Doc uh, involved here. I know Doc wrote a, a piece a few years ago about uh, he called pawn shop prepping, uh, and uh, I'm assuming we can put pawn shops and thrift shops in the same category. Doc, I guess you you talked in the article about some stuff you wouldn't buy, right? Yeah, there are a few things I. Uh... It, unless it's new in the package, uh, sleeping bags or something, I'm a little leery of. Um, and that can be, you know, why did it get sold? Uh, I've run into a few that I think some animals had something to do with. Um, water filtration, um, anything that, you know, I guess I'm a little picky on hats unless, you know, there's some amazing hat. Um, it's something that's kind of more intimate I, I tend to stay away from. But as far as all of the rest of the gear, and when you're talking brands, one of the things I've noticed, um, it's a little different now with the fast Internet that, you know, people can search uh, the, the pawn shop owners or the secondhand owners if they do search. But a lot of the folks who work in these stores don't have experience with the real high-end gear. So to them, I, um, you know, an Arcteryx backpack is just another backpack. In fact, they don't even know how to pronounce the name. And I'm looking at it thinking, that's a $500 backpack. You know, yeah, you want 19 bucks for it. You know, we take 15 sure. You know, or maybe it's a little more than that. Um, and same with cutlery. That You know, that a, um, a U.S.-made, you know, high-end blade is sitting right next to the same brand, but a Chinese-made one. And they're both, you know, 12 bucks a piece. 
you're thinking, well, one probably sold new for 20 and one probably sold new for 120. But unless you discriminate at that level, um, as a seller, you know, it's all the same. They're just moving stuff. And it, it happens, too, in, uh, you know, like Goodwill stores where they really don't look up products unless it's the, you know, the, I know there are some people who do that for them, and often it ends up on auction sites or they try to get a little more money for it. But, yeah, if you, if you go in regularly, you find these things. The other thing I would recommend is to spend a little time in, a, in sporting goods stores actually just looking at the different kinds of gear because I'll often get caught off guard thinking that looks pretty amazing, but I don't know what it is or how it, you know, I don't know what it's worth. And if I head out and go check on it, it's probably going to be gone by the next person like me and, and checks on it. And it might be a high-end compass or a, a particular monocular or um, – you know, optics, sometimes I need a little help trying to sort through the high end from the low end. I got a pair of $1,200 binoculars for 50 bucks. Uh, what? Because the, well, I reckon $50. $50. The tap, or the little metal plate that told what they were, these were Nikon um, premieres. I recognized them because I had actually found another pair previously. And I knew that the BH in the serial number meant that it was that premier series and they didn't know what it was they couldn't look it up because there wasn't a uh, the little plate that told what it was had fallen off and wow. i looked through them and I thought, man these are nice and i looked closer and thought oh my gosh they wanted 75 i gave them 50 <laughs> so i nice. so i'm definitely i'm definitely getting the class today i'm spending way too much money and i need to learn from you guys much better and be more thrifty uh oh there's we all have a limited supply of cash so yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I guess you need is a, a backpack, right, Monty? I mean, and you need one back. Would you guys say you need one backpack for every member of the family? Sure. Yes. And uh, uh, and so, every vehicle and uh, one for the dog. Amen. Mm -hmm. Right. So you might, you know, so, yeah, I have three kids so and two cars and one dog, so I'm going to need nine backpacks, right? And and uh, you want them all to be good. What are the best brands that you can find at thrift stores then? Well, it's from in my opinion, let's just look at, um, I'm going to look up here, and we, we start with REI. Uh, the new stuff is not bad, but it costs you an arm and a leg. You can find older stuff that was made in the U.S., Back in the day when everyone was competing against each other and throwing out some amazing stuff, you can find it a lot cheaper. Um, I mean, I have – if I pay more than 20 bucks for a backpack, it better be special And because I, I find so much stuff dirt cheap. Like right now, while I was waiting for this to start, I've got a, a Kelty Red Wing sitting here that I found for 6 bucks at a store. It was – perfect except for it had a little rip in it i sewed it up it's great and it's becoming my new get home bag for my car um i find so much stuff just going back to what you said a minute ago about keeping bags in cars um i will i will throw an empty backpack in the trunk just to have if you you break down something happens and you've got all your stuff scattered throughout the car you know maybe you weren't quite prepared at least you got a pack you can throw all your stuff in and start humping um, and when you get them for so cheap, it's just, it's easy for me to say, I know there's probably people listening going, yeah, that's not going to happen in my world, but if they just take their time, be patient, hit the stores and start looking for deals, it, it'll happen within a year. It'll happen. Depending okay. on where you live. Cause I, I so pa patience ahead. is key. Patience, patience is key. Is key. Um, and well, like you said, not, not going in with like, okay, I, I got to spend a hundred bucks today but waiting for that, that gem in the thrift shop and taking your time. Yeah, if you can wait, if you can be patient. I mean, if, you, if you're all of a sudden, you wake up in the morning, stock market's crashed a couple thousand points, and you're seeing, you know, riots down the street and everything, you know, you're, it's a little late at that point. Um, I would just recommend, and I, mean, I know I'm speaking to the choir here with you guys, but, you know, start today. You know, start looking up. If you've never been into the thrift stores in your area, you know, find out what's out there. Because like Doc said, you know, there's, there's just deals out. I mean, people don't know what they have. I go in the stores. I found, and here's an example a couple months ago. I'm going through the outdoor area at the Goodwill, 
and I'm going through, there's a bunch of tubs there that, you know, that I love, Rubbermaid, Roughneck Tubs, and uh, I open one up, see if there's anything in it, and there's a tent in there, a red bag, and I didn't look at the bottom, I pick it up, it says $2.99, and I bend it, I go, the poles are in there, sniff it, doesn't stink, I go, I'll take it, if nothing else, you know, I'll give it to a kid to thrash, I don't think another thing about it, I go pay for it, and I throw it in the car with a few other things, come home, open it up, it's a moss tent. Now, I believe it was Frank Moss or Paul Moss. I can't remember. Maybe somebody can correct me on that. He was a uh, fabric designer, and he was making these tents that are super high-end. Well, I've got enough tents. I paid 3 bucks for this thing. I put it on my eBay site, sold it for $265. Damn. And uh, so I take that money, you know, to buy whatever else I may need. So I use that account if I need something new, you know, little things, you know, and I buy that stuff. So that's another aspect of hitting those thrift stores. Once you get, you know, some knowledge about what is worth what, you can, you know, make some money to buy something else also. So, like, right now, the key takeaways for me is patience, yep. frequent the same shops, and yep. then research on the right gear. And the thrift, the thrift shop Goodwill people, they don't know jack about <laughs> what the hell they have. Most of the time. I find that clothing, you know, high-end clothing, because you got a lot of women in there, and they women know clothing, because they pay way too much money for their clothing most of the time compared to guys, and I think all the married men will know that. Um, <laughs> and you know, they so you'll see that stuff priced high, and everything else, like Doc said, they just want to move it. They got so much stuff coming in the back door, they want to price it, they want to move it. It's all about turnover. And, uh, you know, they get a lot of volunteers. Like, I'm one of them, but I'm one of those freaks who I see labels and I know exactly what I'm looking at. You know, I can see a pile of something and there's a strap hanging out and I go, I go and I know the color of that strap and the high quality and I can pull it out and it's a high end <clears throat> because I've been doing it for so long and I own so many of them. Uh, but most of their volunteers don't have a clue. They're like, yeah, put all these, these purses, you know, at five bucks or what have you. Um, so yeah. Yeah, patience and just, and just, you know, make it a routine, you know, and you'll start learning anyone out there who doesn't, who thinks right now they don't have the knowledge of what is good. Spend a, you can spend a lot of time reading and on the internet, but if you just go into the stores and you just look at something and it looks like an older pack, maybe a little dusty, but it's in good shape and it says made in the USA and it's got $5 on it. I bet you it's a good deal. Right. All right, Doc. Oh, go ahead. Not just the not just the big stuff. I mean, the, I find all kinds of amazing little pieces, components. Like in packs, um, I might find uh, side pockets um, or rain covers um, or um, belt pouches. You know, real quality stuff for you know sixty nine cents or a buck ninety nine or something. In the store, they're probably you know twenty nine or thirty nine dollars for these ridiculously overbuilt components um so i'm always shopping in the or, or digging through like the camera bags or the um the wallets because they get these you know hunting things they don't know what they are and it looks kind of like a wallet so they throw it in the wallets um and you end up with some some pretty amazing really specialized stuff same with like knife sharpeners um or small tools tool kits that are uh for very specific purposes you know going back to the cars i outfit all my vehicles with uh, a, a nice collection of high-end tools and it might take me a while and sometimes I even have a list in my pocket I'm missing you know the 14 millimeter you know uh, wrench I'm missing uh, the the seven and the eight millimeter sockets and the quarter inch and the quarter inch drive and I'll just slowly pick up good stuff you know it might not all be the same brand but it's all going to be high-end brands and it's that the store has a you know a 14 millimeter socket one who's going to buy that me you know, so there's tools in there. Too. There's tools in there too. Tons of of high end tools, but you really have to kind of discriminate. And the pawn shops that I frequent know the you know Mac and Snap on. They could care less about Craftsman, but there's a lot of other tools like uh, Williams and Cornwell and um, you know other brands that are really good. Blue Point that they don't really spend. They, they don't have any sex appeal. So uh, I'll pick those things up. 
you know, for a song, sometimes just tossed in, I'll buy a little side pouch for a pack and say, we toss in some sockets and they're looking at, you know, five, you know, or, or three, five gallon buckets of sockets and they don't want them. Yeah, sure. Whatever makes you happy. And, and all of a sudden I've got this set of, you know, a $200 set of sockets sitting in my car that cost me a couple of bucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what about weapons? Uh, I think, if you're talking about pawn shops, people can you can get uh, guns there and stuff like that. Is that right? You're not going to find oh, yeah. those at Goodwill, though, are you? No. No, you're not going to find those at thrift stores at all. You need to know but, your so way we, around used weapons, though, or you'll you'll end up with something unsafe or questionable. And there's a lot of good resources on how to um, kind of do a quick test of a, a firearm in the store. So give me a quick education real quick, because I've gone into pawn shops and I've looked at weaponry and, you know, trying to, I, I love weapons, of course. So I go into pawn shops and I'm like, okay, I want to buy that rifle. Well, it's under pawn right now. So I came in, I put my rifle in pawn. I didn't pay it off. Uh, so now it's the pawn shop's property and now it's available for sale, correct? And yeah, then I can make an offer. I can make period. an offer on it. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's usually a waiting period. And that's also something like in the, in timing. Um, your okay. um, and that's because uh, uh, they may have to go through to see if it was stolen or they can't put anything out for like 45 days or something like that. If it's a say, if it's a gun, um, but then and so they, if it's a gun, would I still, would there still be like an FFL transfer form from yep. a pawn shop? If I want to go buy a shotgun. Yeah. Okay. It's exactly the same as buying from a gun store, unless you're like a concealed carry, then they may just be able to, um, just have oh, yeah, do it. Yeah, do it quickly, quickly without running the background check because you have a CCL. Yeah, but otherwise it's exactly the same. And the person who pawns it often has to fill out the paperwork to get it back because they've lost ownership of it essentially as it's pawned. Because they transferred it. it. Back, they have to transfer it back to the person. So if you guys had success with, with gun buying weapons from pawn shops? Oh, yeah. I had one that I had to take back though, because it turned out it was stolen. It was a, a shotgun, and like nine months later, I got a call from the sheriff. Somebody must have oh, wow. noticed it missing. But you know, they trace it down and said, "Sorry, you got to take it back. They give you your money back, and it's over." But hmm. it was fine with me. Um, yeah, and Monty, where where are you, Monty? I'm in Colorado. Oh, okay. So you're fairly liberal uh, gun laws there, also. Um. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, compared to Montana, I'm sure we are. We've we've def definitely had some setbacks the past couple of years. But uh, you you as you get around, you're talking to people, you realize there's a lot of people who just they don't think much of the laws. Like this last mm -hmm. one, for instance, uh, magazine um, uh, uh, limits. Ten, no, nothing can be sold or transferred within the state of Colorado over, that has over ten rounds. But really? yeah, I mean, anything, even well, what if you buy a Glock 19? So they don't have 10 round mag. They don't have anything over 10 round capacity in the state of Colorado. You that can't go into the store. I believe I mean, this is what I've heard. I haven't I haven't gone to a store to buy one in a long time. But to, to, everybody tells me everything right now, you can't get anything over 10 rounds. So if you were to buy a Glock, you're probably buying it with 10 round mags. I'm huh. guessing. I guess they make them. Yeah, they hmm. make them. And so, yeah. you know, it's still um, like if you, you, a friend of yours wants to sell you some AR 30 round P mags, you know, legally he can't do it. They cannot yeah. be transferred or sold, but it still happens. Um, mm -hmm. And as far as, you know, people talk about the, especially here in Colorado, they talk about the gun show loophole. Well, there really isn't a gun show loophole. That's just a word they use. If you are at a gun show and you're buying from a vendor there, you still have to go through the background check. The loophole, they, as they classify it as, you know, you got people walking around with their M1 Grand on their shoulder with price tag on it, uh, you know, uh, private sellers, and you can buy it from, you could at one point just buy it from them without a background check. as long as Right. And just like arms list anybody else, you know, I could sell it to my neighbor without a, a background check, but that is all now illegal. But mm -hmm. it still does happen. 
Right. right. That happens, and then and then you're saying from a gun show standpoint, there's no there's no higher round capacity mags there, just based on this Colorado law, which that's new to me. I mean, I'm in Texas. Matt's up in New York, so we know how stringent everything's up there for him. He's not going to yeah. be walking into any pawn shops and buying the shotgun anytime soon. Yep. So I mean, it, it's like I can go to Wyoming. You know, I can go take a two-hour trip from where I'm at, go up to Wyoming, buy whatever I want, and mm-hmm. bring it back. I don't know if it's illegal or not. I don't. No. You know, I, don't, yeah. I think it's probably illegal because the way that the rules are written is you can't transfer anything into the state of Colorado. Now everything's yeah. grandfathered in, but how do they know? They don't know. And and all the right. uh, local police I've talked to said it's a completely unenforceable law, and and they're not even looking for it. They got too many other things to worry about. They think it's all. BS. Most of the cops in this area lean right. Mm-hmm. Right. So what else from the, the thrifty survivalists? What else can what else should they be looking for? How could well, they acquire that good gear? Or what are what are key essentials that uh, that you believe you know they should have? Well, I I look at it initially. I'm always looking for hard to produce stuff. Let's just say whether it be from for a grid down scenario or just a complete dive in the economy or a slow decay, whatever it is, that so it's hard to produce stuff like clothing, ammo, gear, um, you know, pots and pans, things around your house, you know, that stuff that would be hard to produce on your own if you didn't have it and you can't go to the store and get it. Um, another you know, one thing I don't find a lot in thrift stores is I do find good gardening supplies as far as shovels and things, which I'm completely maxed out on that stuff. But, um, gosh, hard to produce stuff. What else would that be? Um, well, while you mentioned the gardening stuff, that's where you should go to the uh, – you could do it on Amazon too, but go to a, a good gardening store and familiarize yourself with brands. Right. Um, because a lot of people don't know – you know, one brand of shovel from another, or they hear a, they, a popular name like True Temper or something to think that must be good. I remember that. Well, they remember it as a kid, not the junk made in China today, but, you know, like Blue Elephant or something. You, you're going to get some really amazing stuff, um, a Corona or Silky, for pennies because nobody knows that that's a $50 shovel and that's a, you know, four ninety nine shovel. The next part of the Survivalist podcast is brought to you by the Perry Blade Survival Knife, designed by SAS legend Mel Perry. For more information, visit PerryBlade.com. That's Perry P A R R Y Blade.com. Well, and I have to say too, just uh, looking at you know brands are great. I love it. love high quality stuff, uh, but if you can get yourself a good uh, pointed spade shovel that's in great shape for three bucks pretty much a throwaway shovel. So you can use that for a season or two. If it craps out on you, what's the big deal? No big loss, right? So, well, I guess assuming you have space to put all this stuff. There you go. <laughs> that, right. There, there's right. the other part of this. I, I'm lucky enough, my wife is very tolerant, but I don't encroach upon the rest of the living space. I have my office mm-hmm. space here, and then I have some outbuildings that I throw my stuff in. Um, and so... Just to explain my, I guess, point of view or what my focus is, I've got enough for me, my family, and I'm look right now. I can supply a whole squad of people, plus, with everything, and you know I'm working towards a platoon. So um, Mark understands that uh, where I'm coming mm-hmm. from as far as numbers, but uh, mm-hmm. just my ad. I, I guess I was born with this attitude. Um, growing up without much, um, I joined the army reserves in 1980 and, uh, there wasn't, you know, not a whole lot in this area. We have a heavy engineer combat battalion, uh, under the 90, oh gosh, it's been a while, 95th or 96th RCOM. Um, and it was, you know, heavy equipment engineers. I, so my, my first MOS was supply. They needed somebody mm-hmm. in that area. I was like, sure. So I, I went into supply, and my backup MOS was heavy equipment operator. So I was having a blast. It was the 80s. There was nothing going on. You know, to me, it was just all fun training and doing stuff. But, boy, I got the bug as far as gear goes. Um, and being an organizational freak and a numbers guy, you know, I was always like, hey, we need to order more of this stuff. We need some of this stuff as backup. And so, and then I went into warehousing. 
And uh, as far as, you know, when I running warehouses for large companies and I just, boy, it just, I don't know what grows on you. All of a sudden it's just that collecting thing. It's like, I want a box of side pouches, like Doc said. I want a box of uh, compasses so that when somebody comes to me and they say, hey, you know, I lost this, I need this, you can just pull it out and go, here you go, and you send them on their way. And that's kind of where I'm at with my prepping because, you know, to me, no man is an island. Is that the saying? Um, yes. You know, yep. a lot of people want to be that lone wolf and they think they're going to hunker down in their place, you know, bug in and, and uh, nobody's going to come on their place. But in reality, you can only cover one window, one door. So you got to have a group of people around you. And I know a lot of my friends, and, and this is something I guess might get off the ranch here a little bit, but um, I don't think a, you're in danger. Let me just say, I don't think you're in danger of going off the ranch with us, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at building all. a community, we, you know, we have friends. There's right. 90 homes in my subdivision, and I'm going to say eight of them, if the grid were to go down tomorrow, they'd be okay. The rest of them are freaking clueless. But there are some nice people, and there's some elderly people in my neighborhood I would want to help out. But, uh, you know, a lot of these people just don't ha- have what it takes on a day-to-day basis to be thinking like we think. It's like, boy, you know, these, uh, this hominy's on sale. I'm going to grab a couple extra cans or a case. They don't think that way, and it's hard to get through to them. So, and it goes, it's the same with gear and tools and all that stuff. You know, you go to their house and it's Spartan and you're like, and you look in their pantry and they've got like three days worth of food. And I wonder how they sleep at night. You know, I lose them my mind when I see this stuff, but they're still, they're nice people and I want to be able to help them out. Is that yeah. insane? Is that, you know, am I being uh, too idealistic? I don't know. But if well, I have, you, ability, yeah, last, last, I'm sorry, go ahead, Monty, please. Well, just to finish this up, if I have the ability to help out some of my friends who were not thoughtful enough to, to, to go down this road and secure my neighborhood, I'm going to do it, at least in the short term. Well, from I a security sense, yeah. from a security standpoint, uh, you providing gear to your neighbors, that could be a recruiting tool. And again, like you yeah. said, you can only cover one window, one door. You, can, you can't stay up for you know, 48, 72, 96. You can only stay up for so long. So the more individuals you have, you could have more security. You could have another window covered. You could have a sleep pattern. You know, all the things we've learned in the military to uh, divide the work and provide additional security and early warnings if you're in that scenario. And so with that gear, hey, come help us. Here's some chow. Here's a pack. Right. Here's a weapon. Um, don't turn it's it on just, me. I'll kind your of bartering. Throat stuff right you're bar- right that's, that's bartering stuff. like items. hey exactly. i need i need a latrine dug you know i need yeah. somebody to uh to till this garden you know and here's i'll give you this you need that and here's a bowl of rice and whatever you know if it, if it keeps the ball rolling and obviously mm-hmm. you can have a lot of attrition at some point i can see a lot of the people up here going down into the mountains you know and i've we have a joke amongst a few of us up here who are like if there's certain groups of people that we just don't want around because we know they're going to be uh, a liability. Mm-hmm. We'll just tell them and say, "Hey, yeah, FEMA's you know giving out a bunch of stuff, and we'll give them an address down in uh, down in the flatlands, and hopefully they don't come back." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then mm-hmm. the house is there for us to use for to give to someone who will be a benefit to the to the community. Hmm. But that's probably a wrong way to think about it. Probably not. That's legal. A good little... I, I never said that. Scratch that from the recording. Uh, well, that's, that's a good little deception plan. <laughs> There's nothing illegal about that. Doc, Doc, are you um, okay on time, or do you have to get get going? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay, right. great. So one thing, uh, one of my favorite articles on uh, Survival Cash is the um, hundred items to disappear first. And I know this is a big, uh, a big comp, uh, a big source of discussion among preppers. And and uh, you guys are familiar with this concept, right? Yep. Yeah. And so obviously mm-hmm. you need to get those now and you need to get those and have them. So um, in terms of uh, thinking about bargains, Monty, generators, can you get, can you get a generator at a bargain? Um, the only bar- bargains I have found, I found some stuff on Craigslist, you know, search around, search around. I end up getting a whole house generator um, for about two thirds of what they normally go for. 
Um, it still was a big expenditure. It's a big propane unit. It doesn't get used that often, but it's, it's a nice thing. The girls love it. Power goes out in the winter, and they can still take their hot showers, and the lights are still working. But it's a big energy hog. I did find a very good Honda um, EU1000i generator. I don't know if you guys are familiar with those. Yeah. Super quiet. Sips gas. I mean, it, I can one? run that thing for like 8 to 10 hours on a half a gallon of gas. It's only 1,000 watts, but that will run anything I really need to except for my well pump which is an issue because I have installed a hand well pump now too. So, And those are the best, right? The Honda, in, that's an inverter, right? Inverter yeah, it's generator. Got built, yep, it's got built-in inverter. Uh, they make them in 1, 2, and 3,000 watts. And uh, I got some friends that own the 2,000 ones, and I, I would be looking at those. You can run them together. Um, so if you have a 1,000 like I do and you want to bump up and you go buy a 2,000, you can run either one of them or both at the same time. They'll link up. They are amazing. You know, Honda makes some great motors. Right. Something okay, with number that on the, on yeah, the go ahead, shop side is to, is to study that ahead of time because you'll stumble on those. I do see them occasionally, and you have to kind of get used to the price. Like it might be $400, and you're thinking, oh, my gosh, I use a generator that's not very big for 400 bucks. Right. Well, yeah, but it's 900 or 1200 brand new. So then it comes down to the next level of can you look at it and get an idea of the condition and the, the amount of use. Um, and you may end up with a screaming deal on a generator because, you know, the, the fellow who runs the pawn shop doesn't think he's going to unload a $1,200 generator. So he makes some some crazy deal to the guy who needs the money and all of a sudden it's sitting there and it, then it becomes a race. Who knows what this is? Who can figure it out the fastest and pick it up and... You're never going to regret that, you know. Right. Yeah, I, paid, I paid 500 for my little generator. They go for 900 to 1,000. Ended yeah. up being a good deal. But yeah, Doc, you're right. You know, unless you're going to sit there and tear it apart and look at some things, you know, sometimes you may be taking a risk, and that's part of the deal too. Um, just like buying firearms, you know, unless you know what you're looking at, use stuff. You're taking a chance. Luckily, I've got. I've got some experience with that stuff, so I can break things down and take a quick look at it. I have yet to be really burned on a firearm. Mm -hmm. Number two, water filters. Uh, I think, Doc, this is something you were saying you wouldn't buy used. But not unless it's new in the package um, or, you know, it's from a friend or something. But, yeah, although what I have stumbled on are the cartridges. Um, I use a lot of MSR filters with ceramic cartridges, and I've stumbled on those cartridges you know, somebody buys one, the filter breaks, they donate it to Goodwill, and there it is on the shelf. It's very specific to a filter, brand new in the box, 40 bucks off the shelf at the the sporting goods store, and here it is for 99 cents. And I'm probably the only one in five miles that knows what this thing is. Again, I'm shopping in the wrong location. <laughs> yeah, that's that's changing. Like you said, Marty, that shit's changing today. Mark's the champagne prepper, I guess. Uh, well, if, if you got the money, traveling. you know, then why not? <laughs> college or, well, or I get it, I get it discounted through our, you know, through through Ford Survival Supply. So, right. uh, yeah, of course, um, yeah. If I, I if I need something quickly, then it's it's to the local sporting goods store or something. But other than that, I'm like, hey, Joel, send me some shit, dude. Uh, yeah, and I'm joking with you. And everybody really should yeah. probably buy stuff at Ford's. And this whole podcast is probably there, something you some shouldn't even be podcasting. <laughs> yeah. Uh portable mm -hmm. toilets. That's number three on the survival cash list. Can you get portable toilets in a uh thrift store and would you want to? No. Why <laughs> Ditto. I mean, why would yeah. you want a portable toilet? Um if the worst case scenario, and I have this in my camper van, in case we needed it, if we went to a place we couldn't find anything, I got one of those five gallon buckets, got cat litter in it, and got a little yep. uh, luggable loo toilet seat on it bada bing um and so you got what you know if you paid full price for everything there's 20 bucks right there um those portable okay. toilets i just don't i don't understand them hey i'm of the added i'll dig i'll get my spade that we've talked about for three bucks and i'm digging a cat hole you yeah know, there you go a bear shit does a bear shit in the woods yes and so does poo holly if you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only, the only i place don't even I know what a portable uh, toilet is actually I've seen them. You really? see them a lot in RVs and things like that, or um, like you know, some camper vans will have them. Little things you pull out, and basically you empty. It. There's a tray or a bag or something, and you empty them. It's not a whole lot different than a five-gallon bucket with a luggable loo on it, but 
they cost a whole lot more. The difference um, really comes into play if you're working with somebody who's elderly or has a disability. Um, that's a big difference. And part of the reason is that um, if they they can't, they don't have muscle strength or they're, they're having trouble or, you know, moving or whatever, they may end up creating your health hazard, um, making a mess of things. Than if they're <laughs> Literally, yeah, very, very reason. Down. Very well said, Doc. Uh, seasoned mm-hmm. firewood, that's number four on the list. Can you get a bargain on firewood? If you want to go out to, and where I live, it's ample. And so here's, I've got five, ten seasons worth of wood stored up. I burn, it's my sole source of heat. I burn about five cords a year. Um, I got tons of it. Uh, it's also, I cut trees for a living all summer long. So I just, you know, I barter it away and store it and whatever and sell a little bit off. But uh, the forest is littered with down trees. Yeah, and right now, you have to go get a permit to do it. But in a more dire situation, you know, people can go out and get it themselves and they better have a good saw. Yeah, that's be able your to pawn shop side right there. The chainsaws. Know your way around them, know what size bar and brands and condition, and um, you can pick up a, a screaming good chainsaw for 100 bucks. pick up a good axe, pick up a, a buck saw um, or two or three Yep. Um, for or 10 for not much. There's, yeah. your, uh, mm-hmm. there's your bargain prepping. Yeah, yeah and there, you there's, your, there's your barter thing, too. you got a bunch of extra things like that. That's a good thing to barter away to your neighbors and friends to get some work done. Yeah, yeah, or get some food in exchange, right? There you go. Uh, lamp oil, wicks, lamps, and lanterns. Yeah, I've got crates of them. Yeah, if you pick up the Coleman stuff uh, at the the used stores, you know, if you can know your way around them, you can do a few tests. But the stoves and the lamps that they make, especially the multi-fuel ones, you can usually pick up pretty cheap. Yeah, I've found uh, gallons of candle oil. Mm-hmm. Um, and candle fuel, whatever you want to call it, that you can use in tiki torches or, you know, in your lanterns for ninety nine cents, a buck ninety nine at the thrift stores, and I've got, I got gallons of it. How about uh, camp stove fuel? That is that like what they use for catering? Camp stove fuel? No. No. Camp Usually stove fuel is gas. also called white gas. Like yeah, Coleman white gas, fuel. exactly. And like the uh, Coleman. It, yep. So it keeps for a good long time as long as you keep it airtight. But, you know, it's it's got a better shelf life than regular gas, that's for sure. But it can still go bad on you. Um, the other stuff you're talking about is like sterno stuff. Oh, yeah, that's what I was mm-hmm. thinking of. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. something different. Does that Do preppers keep that stuff, the sterno? I've got some just because um, it could come in handy, you know. I have some warming trays. I used to do pig roasts. So I've still got that equipment, you know, where you'd, uh, chafing dishes, they're called. Um, and I've got some around, but it also works good, especially the older stuff, uh, for fire starter. <laughs> you scoop it out of there and you slab it on some, uh, um, your logs and stuff and take a match to it. And it works pretty good that way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number seven is guns, ammunition, pepper spray knives. We already kind of talked about that stuff. Well, ammunition, you can't get that stuff at a bargain ever, can you? Am- ammo is just very expensive, as far as I can tell. Yeah, it's stupid expensive right now. Um, it is. It's insane for from a reloading reloading standpoint, like for, for primers, for uh, brass casings, it's insanely overpriced. I picked up some stuff, like some dyes and some bullets, uh, from doing bargain shopping with Black Friday and Cyber Monday, and I got some decent deals, but it's it's all risen just in light of what's going on in the government, just crazy, crazy prices. And uh, but I've never I've never seen any of that shopping stuff in any of the not the big big stores like a Cabela's, a Bass Pro, a, a local gun shop, or what have you. Yeah, no, I I found this uh, website called LuckyGunner.com, I think, that had uh, nine millimeter for, I think, like you get it brass for 22 cents a round or something if uh, if you buy a thousand. That's the cheapest I've ever come across. But you guys probably know more than me on that. So, I mean, not probably, you do know more than me on that subject. That sounds like a good price for a thousand rounds of brass. 
Yeah, that is a good price. LuckyGunner.com. I have nothing to do with them, but I know that they have good prices. Um, and then, so what about, uh, let's see here, water containers, grain grinders, lantern mantles, propane cook stoves, all that stuff do you think you can find? I've, yeah, I've picked up uh, military-grade water containers um, for cheap. I'm real heavy, thick plastic ones. Um, as far as like, uh, mantles and stuff like that, um, I'd be very careful if some of the old stuff just disintegrates. It's hard to know. And those are so cheap when you, uh, get them anyway, um, brand new, but yeah, they just keep your eye out. Cause you may not have been looking for that, you know, 10 gallon, you know, uh, desert earth colored military grade water container, but there it is in front of you. And then there's a price on it and you have to know, you know, roughly what something like that is. I think I paid five bucks for mine, brand new, uh, looked it up and I think it was uh, about $49 if I was to buy it, this particular grade one. Wow. But others might only be $5 brand new. So you have to be a little careful. Usually yeah, the big thing with quality. those, make sure you don't see any cracks in them and open it up and take, give it the sniff test. Yeah, the sniff test is huge. <laughs> it is. Because mm -hmm. you never know what was in that thing. If you open it up and there's a funky smell in there, just walk away. Because you don't even Unless want to try want to and spend your time sterilizing or scrubbing it out. It's just not worth it. Yeah, yeah, is it like if it had gasoline in it or something, it's never going to be okay to drink out of, right? Well, they could have left it open with a little water in it and some critter crawled in there and drowned and, and putrefied and ugh. just walk away. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Monty, this has been super informative. What about any other last tips for us on bargain prepping? Um, Boy. You know, when you're going to a thrift store, you know, there's a, there's a big, you know, people talk about long-term shopping versus short-term, you know, long-term being, you know, I'm putting stuff away for the future, you know, I'm going to put it away, it's got good shelf life versus stuff I'm going to use right now. You got to be willing to buy any of that stuff, as long as stuff's not going bad on you, you know, as far, especially food when you go to the store, you know, if you buy a case of, of diced tomatoes and it sits for 20 years, yeah, you probably, you know, you're not rotating it. You know, you might be wasting your money. So just be, you know, don't buy stuff because it's a good deal. If you're, you know, stuff with a shelf life, don't buy it unless you're going to use it. Other stuff, people need to kind of open up their minds a little bit as far as, hey, I've, yeah, I've got my backpack. My wife's got her backpack. I got one in the car. But look at this deal. God, can I store it? Like you said earlier, do you have a place to store it? If you have a closet and it's a killer deal, get it, because you may need it down the line. Maybe your friend needs it. Help out a friend. I do that a lot. I got into this stuff online with Jarhead allowing me to give away a bargain bob on, hit, on Shit Hits Fan Blog. And I ended up giving away four systems because there were so many needy people, just out of stuff that I get at thrift stores. And uh, it was nice to be able to help some people out, but, you know, I, I just love the stuff. So just keep an open mind, you know, when you're looking at stuff, go, God, it's a great deal. If I, and maybe you can sell it on eBay and buy your, you know, buy something else. You never know. Um, the other thing, let's see, I had a note here. Where is it? Oh, we were talking about uh, the, the 100 items that disappear quickly. Seeds. If you have any gardening experience, you know, if, you know, I would try and buy some seeds, put them in a vacuum sealer, throw them in the freezer for now. That would be a good thing. Who does? How like long would friends? they last then? Oh, yeah, seeds is number thirty-two on the survival cash list. Okay, uh, um, longer than you. <laughs> yeah, if you want you, mm -hmm. if you vacuum seal them, make sure they're nice and dry. Vacuum seal them, throw them in the freezer. They're good to go. And then everything hits the fan. There's no more grid. You got to pull everything out of the freezer. Where you're going to want those seeds anyway? And you know, let them thaw, and they're still going to be good for a good long time. You know, for a year as long as you keep them in a cool, dry spot. Um, and you're going to get out there with that back, with that hoe and that shovel that you picked up at the thrift store and start turning some soil, start planting some seeds. Um, and I wanted to say, I, I was listening to uh, Doc's last podcast, and you guys were talking about doing a bugging in podcast potentially. Yes. Uh, that, wow. is, that is what I really prepare for more than anything. I, I can leave my house with you know, with my packs and I got my survival packs and, and feel pretty confident about it, but I want to stay home. And I think most people out there would prefer to stay home. So, uh, when they're out there looking for the bargains at the thrift stores, they really need to be thinking along those lines, like, okay, power goes down. 
you know, is this thing going to help me? You know, this like this solar flashlight. There's some good ones, there's some bad ones. But boy, I tell you what, they're really nice. So people need to be thinking along those terms, and I wouldn't mind being involved in that conversation. Oh, definitely. Yeah. All right. Monty, thank you so much. We will definitely have you on again. Thanks for all the useful information. You at least changed Mark's life. I know that. Yeah. By just, by just looking for bargains? Look for bargains. For, and I think I'm pretty frugal as it is, but uh, I need to – I need to do AKA the Monty style. I need to get a routine down that I start doing like on a monthly basis that um, I'm in San Antonio, Texas. So everything is in relative close proximity. It won't even take me that long. I just need to put it on my, it's on my radar now and I need to just start exploring because I'm kind of a gear, a gear queer. Anyway, I, I want, I want the, the most gear. I want to have redundancy in it. And so why not bargain shop it instead of buying it at a, at an REI or a We Have Academy here or Dick's Sporting Goods or what have you. Yeah, it's about uh, having, online. A, little, about having a little bit more of an open mind towards certain things too. You know, you can get into, you know, I want the Marine Corps MARPAT ILBC, which I owned and I end up selling because it's so dang over-engineered and heavy, and I go mm-hmm. to other things. You know, I prefer, God, I prefer the uh, Molly large rucksack or an old Alice pack to those things. Yeah, that's. I have my old Alice pack is like one of my is my ultimate bug out bag. Yeah, I'm, just, I, I'm looking at mine right now, and uh, mm-hmm. I love the thing. I've enhanced it. I got I, I you know done a bunch of modifications to it, and it is my go to thing right now. Yep. So, I mean, anyway, boy, I could talk all day about that stuff. Mark, don't be scared yeah. about bargaining, or I mean about uh, haggling over price if you're at a pawn shop too. You know, they'll put okay. down a high price on a, in, hoping somebody's going to impulse buy. But I've had stuff I say, take less on this, and they come back half price. You know? Wow. Or you say, you, if you see a price and it's like $120, you know, obviously they're going to sell it for 100 easily. Mm-hmm. So you'd come in like, would they take 75 and anywhere else that'd be an insult. And, you know, they'll, they'll round up to 90 And that's, mm-hmm. you're thinking, that's still a screaming deal. You know, yeah. even the... The blunt binoculars I mentioned, they wanted 75, I offered 50. I gave myself, you know, a 33% discount. Mm-hmm. But to them, it's, you know, just moving numbers around. So, yeah. Well, my friend of mine who was in that business, he told me too, uh, one of the little things is how they price stuff. So, say there's something priced for 100 bucks, they paid 40 or less for it. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, they leave themselves plenty of wiggle room there. So if you were to, you know, say I'll give you sixty, they're going to go, oh no way, I may do eighty, and you play that little game, I guess, do that dance, but knowing that they only paid forty for it, and they want to move the stuff. Yeah, all right. Buy something for fifty bucks, and you see a couple of sockets or a wrench or whatever, see if they'll toss them in, because then it's a lot easier than if you walk up and say how much for these, and they'll say I don't know, buck a piece. You just got them for free. I I love the uh, toss in. That's a great. That's a great. Yeah. This is a really good information, and thank you, Monty. You're welcome, you guys. Thanks, Monty. You've been listening to the Survivalist Podcast with Mark Puhali, Doc Montana, and Matt Gould. Brought to you by Survival Cash, Forge Survival Supply, Epic Water Bottles and Filters, and the Perry Blade. Please visit our website, thesurvivalistpodcast.com, for more information.